understand is uh, the Heisenberg algebra. And uh, as we were discussing, uh, not having a blackboard is going to be a major impediment, uh, especially to those who are completely unfamiliar with this or have never seen it before, even though they may have uh, the uh, mathematical maturity. Uh, not having a blackboard is going to be a problem, so we're going to try to circumnavigate that. The Heisenberg algebra uh, states uh, specifically that uh, we have uh, one operator, uh, let's call it A, for annihilation, and it's Hermitian conjugate with the property that the Lee commutator of destruction, A, with its Hermitian conjugate, A plus, or A dagger, is going to be equal to 1. Now, this, uh, this Lee bracket is going to uh, bespeak to uh, fermionic, uh, I mean, uh, bosonic uh, issues, and not uh, necessarily fermionic issues. Uh, there are ways around that. So for the moment, I'm going to stay with a Lee bracket. And uh, one of the things I want to say is that from this we can define an oscillator Hamiltonian. And I am not going to pass to the uh, second quantized uh, Hamiltonian A dagger A alone, but instead the oscillator Hamiltonian in a single dimension is going to be A dagger A plus one half. That's our famous one-half Planck's constant uh, that uh, is going to be the minimum energy value of the uh, oscillatory system from the so-called L2, or the Hilbert space, uh, 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 sort of contributed error, the RMS, uh, the RMS uh, fluctuation from the, uh, from the standard arithmetical mean, which would be given by an integral alone and not the integral of a square. What we want to look at is a, a very important result. Um, namely, uh, it's a simple result, but it's very important. And it says the following. Whenever we've got a Hilbert space vector, it says more than this. It speaks to a Bonnach space, uh, especially of the form LP. Uh, the LP spaces, but it says for any um, state vector that we have, uh, we can decompose it into an L1, which is simply integrable over the real line, plus an L infinity, which is essentially bound uh, over the real line. Now, this result is important because it says that Hilbert space is always going to be a weak direct sum of the first Bonnach space, L1, and the final Bonnach space, L infinity, of bound functions. This is important because the integrable functions are the bound states of quantum field theory, okay? The guys that are L infinity are the guys that can persist even at spatial infinity, and this is very important. So what it tells us is that whenever we have a Hilbert, space, a Hilbert space state vector, what we find is that it can be decomposed, not necessarily uniquely, there are many decompositions, but it can be decomposed into a bound state, which is one which is relatively localized, associated generally with fixed energy, or a particular fixed set of quantum numbers, energy being one, but it also, together with that, is going to be some sort of state that can be finite at infinity. For example, a rippling wave that never ceases to stop rippling and ripples all throughout time, all the way, all the way up to and including uh, infinity. So it's rather fascinating to see some of our uh, our. Um, unusual curves. I think of it this way. This is as remarkable as saying any bizarre graph you see can be written as some sort of bell-shaped curve plus some sort of sinusoidal waveform. Uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a rather, and because if you take the superposition of those, if you simply add those together, 
you would you, you would think that uh, you would get a very 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 bizarre design, but you've got to remember we're in the L2 world where we square things and then take the uh, then integrate and then take the square root of that. So uh, uh, we have some uh, some 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 uh, some interesting phenomena happening uh, in 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 the, in the quantum domain. So, so we can always take our state vectors and decompose them into bound states plus states which persist at infinity, and uh, at spatial infinity. And I want to say something about this. This is technically statistical uh, infinity. This is not space-time as we think of it, but uh, this is not time-space as we think of it. This is actually a statistical uh, record-keeping uh, space that we use to keep track of our field theoretic results. Okay, for example, we perform an experiment, we have a result, we put it on a graph, and this graph is not representative of physical space, physical time at all. In fact, quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics by itself is nothing other than a look at the statistical record-keeping book being graphed and really has little to do with the actual structure of time and of space. This is a very, very, very unusual, uh, n very essential aspect of the theory is that uh, it's always dealing with the so-called odds, the quantum odds. So there is a very real question as to uh, its relevance in, in the physical sciences. Uh, for short times, short durations, very short, small disturbances, we do have um, a great deal of, of, of uh, theoretical uh, information being verified by experiment that uh, quantum field theory is uh, is, is a relevant tool, however. So this is not to say that uh, quantum field theory is a complete joke. It's to say that it is uh, it is a tool in in, in the works, and 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 uh, and we must see it as such. Okay. So now that we've seen that we can take a, uh, a Hilbert space vector. Uh, and we want to keep in mind that the squared modulus of this guy, um, when we integrate its conjugate um, together with uh, the original waveform or the original state vector itself, we should get some relative of the not necessarily normalized expected value. We should get a constant times an expected value of some sort, or a, or a probability, or a mode, an idea of where a mode may be. We should get some some statistical data from it. Uh, one thing needs uh, to be said about uh, arithmetical averages. Uh, many people have heard the terms mean, mode, and median. Uh, a mean is somewhat self-explanatory, and for those unfamiliar with the term, it can be found in the literature in a variety of places. Um, as for median, I'm going to avoid that for a moment, um, um, perhaps even a long time, but the term mode is a place on our statistical graph where we have a particular critical phenomenon taking place. For example, the graph crosses zero. We have a zero of our uh, distribution. We have a maximum, a minimum, uh, an inflectionary point. Uh, there could be other behavior. Uh, it could be a multidimensional graph, and we have a saddle point. So anytime we speak of the term mode, it is not a most frequently occurring number. It is, if we're counting pennies, stacking them, and we find the maximum is going to be at a most frequently occurring number of pennies. But we're not playing with pennies. We are talking about gathering statistical data from experiment. 
And because of this, we are looking at a maximum value, a minimum value, a critical point. And this is what a mode is. And L2 values should, when we apply them to operators in evaluating the matrix elements, we should obtain means expected values, modes, or transition elements. And the transition elements of the matrices that uh, represent these operators uh, contain in them the transition amplitude, transition frequency. This entails the duration of the phenomenon itself because a frequency is a reciprocal of a time quantity, uh, depending on whether it's linear frequency, angular frequency, or the reciprocal of a period, a period being ipso facto a frequency. There are some important things to bear in mind here. Uh, statistical space is a space, and uh, Even though we can look at bound states, we want to look at uh, we want to look at particular bound states associated with an oscillator for 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 this for this uh, for this prelect. Uh, we want to look at some unnormalized states. Most people would complain and object to the use of non-normalized state vectors. There's a reason why, and uh, the reason why goes back to my late friend Paul Dirac, uh, who developed the uh, the entire notion, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and 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 he was quite good at it. Uh, let's think of the oscillator Hamiltonian again. It's a dagger A plus one half. We're not going to dispense with the one half. We're not going to renormalize the one half away. We're going to keep it. We're not going to identify the oscillator Hamiltonian with an occupation number operator. We are going to keep them distinct. Now, the oscillator states are polynomials. And they form a complete, in, in, in this context, we're going to take the oscillator uh, 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 states to be simple powers of x, okay? Now, hopefully, this will be far more vivid in a webcast where we have no blackboard, uh, because polynomials we can, we can picture. Powers of x we can picture far better. We can think of them in our mind. In fact, uh, familiar powers of x. We're going to look at integral powers of x, for that matter. x to the plus 3, uh, x to the third, x squared, x first, uh, x to the zero, which is simply the constant function 1. Um, now, as you've noticed, I've stepped down, okay, from x to the third to x to the second to x to the first to x to the zero. Uh, the next stage is zero itself, which is uh, uh, essentially where, in statistical space, our um, our, um, our, uh, our our mode resides. But the point is, we're going from x to the third to x to the second to x to the first, to x to the zero to x to zero, and what we're doing is we are jumping down. Each time we jump down one power from the third to the second power, a quantum is emitted, okay? That is destruction. We have destroyed a quanta, or we've made it unhappy, let's put it that way. It has decided to leave. It has been ejected from the system, okay? And that is, that is actually... Uh, the emission of a quantum right there, okay? Now, relative to the C of all quanta from whence, uh, the, 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 relative to the C of quanta of the, uh, of the electromagnetic field, it's a production of a photon because it's returned home. So in other words, it departs, and we have
have a vacuum. We have a, we, we're missing a photon. We're grieving over it, and, uh, and 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 then it is returned to its home, where it's received, and the number of photons is increased by unity. Okay. We step down from the second power of X to the first power of X. Again, a photon's emitted, let's say. And uh, a, a, guy, a, a guy goes from our house. We, we, our loss is, the, is, the, is, the, is the, the, the photonic sees gain, so to speak. We go from the first power to the zeroth power. Another photon is emitted. And once again, we've... We've lost uh, another photon, but once again, a sea of photons has been increased by unity again. And finally, we annihilate everything and go to zero by jumping from the zeroth power of X to zero itself. The reason why zero is going to be our, uh, our mode is because we are about to transcend into the world of negative energy values, which is one of the byproducts of the Klein-Gordon equation, uh, our relativistic wave equation in its most simple form. And once we get into the negative energy solutions, we are going to begin producing a lot of so-called noise, and I want everyone who's listening to this particular prelect to think of the L infinity part, the persistent L infinity part of the wave functions as finite noise, but localized quanta at infinity. Begin perceiving quanta in a, we've heard of wave particle duality, I want you to think of now an origin infinity duality where we go from the origin to infinity by the inversion x goes to one over x x is taken to its reciprocal because when we begin averaging out these particular states we're going to find out that these guys are going to give us a particular mean value between the minimum positive energy of plus one-half, the maximum negative energy of minus one-half, again in rationalized units of Planck's constant times frequency. And we're going to find everything centered about the origin. And that is why zero is going to be our mean, our mode, and our median in this particular case. What we have to think of right now are several things. First of all, we're going to have to think of, since we're going into the world of negative energy, we are going to have to begin thinking of positive energy and negative energy. Uh, these are not foes, but friends. These are good friends that work simultaneously to give us good quantum numbers. We are going to have to think of the sign of the energy as a quantum number. So I want everyone who's listening to this to begin thinking of quantum numbers along the lines of cat, N, N being energy. A sigma, sort of an isotopic spin, if you will, with eigenvalues plus one half and minus one half for positive energy and negative energy. Under this, we are going to have to add the following. We're going to have to add a second quantum number. Let's call it tau. And that is going to have to be another fermionic quantum number with eigenvalues plus one-half and minus one-half. And the reason we have to add two of these guys is because we must maintain neutrality. We could not turn a boson into a fermion or a fermion into a boson without just cause. And we do not have just cause because we are describing simple particle states. In order to do this, we must, at this point, add both a fermionic and a fermionic to get a bosonic, which is a rather neutral guy, and it's going to be an isobosonic. So we have two isofermionics that are going to tensor together in an anti-symmetric way, 
as to give us from the fermionic vacuum a fermionic state which is of spin one or isospin, isotopic spin, so that we can actually maintain integrity. And I will emphasize once again, this is an isotopic spin. We are adding two new quantum numbers. Another thing is we're going to have a phase factor. This is a topological charge number. So begin throwing in a topological charge Q. It's going to be quantized integrally. Okay. Now, <clears throat> beyond that, let's take a look at how we get to infinity. By the inversion, x goes to 1 over x. This is a, mo a, com this is a most commonly encountered Mobius transformation. It, the beauty in this guy is that it, too, induces a Z2 symmetry, Z2 being a group that carries several representations. We take it as multiplication of plus 1 and minus 1. Okay, in this correspondence, plus one corresponds to zero, and minus one corresponds to plus one. This is a very uh, beautiful representation, and, 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 it, and it has, it's going to impose the so-called Z2 check cohomological conditions on our, on our base manifold, our, our space that we're going to be looking at. Beyond this, I want you to begin thinking of what we're doing here. We have added 1 over 0 is going to take us straight out to that ideal point at infinity. We've taken a one-dimensional problem, and we've turned it into a projective line. A projective line can be modeled best by a circle. If we just simply look at what we're doing, we find out that it is a compact space. It is closed, bound, it is immersible in the plane, and it is a circle. It has curvature. Curvature is ipso facto field strength. And so we're going to be carrying quantized field strength values. So we're going to have many, many more quantum numbers. And so from this simple oscillator, when we start looking at the L infinity states, those states capable of persisting, capable of inhabiting infinity, I want you to continue to think of these guys as creating no finite noise, but perfect harmony at infinity to pick up some a, a new identity at infinity. But now we're looking at a closed space, a nice little tiny circle. So we go from the infinitely long line to the nice bound circle by embedding that one-dimensional line in a circle minus a point. And there we have the effect of curvature. This is the difference between quantum phase space in reality, quantum phase space and Liouville's classical phase space, namely that we do have, instead of spheres, uh, in, in many of my publications I refer to uh, the, 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 the geodetic sphere bundles. Uh, I use them as a, 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 a classical phase space and go to the quantum from there. But the true quantum phase space uh, that I've uh, <laughs> used in most of my publications is the tori, okay? The tori T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, so on. Uh, Tn, where n is the number of degrees of freedom uh, of the uh, particular system itself. Uh, in terms of spatial variables alone. Now notice what we're doing, we're shifting downwardly. Now each one of these guys is a state vector, it's a vector in a Hilbert space. X to the third is a vector, X squared is a vector, X to the first is a vector, X to the zeroth is a vector. Uh, and the point is we are shifting these vectors downwardly in, in, in power, okay? So 
what is happening? We are destroying as we go down. This is, this is the operation of destruction. We are moving downwardly until we eventually hit the vacuum state, which happens to be the constant function one, or x to the zeroth, okay? Once we, once we hit that guy, if we destroy anything else, the entire system is blown to oblivion and we hit the vector zero, the zero vector, which is where it, where, where it all ends. Now the point being, this is a shift operator, a downward shift operator, and it is the destruction operator where we go from four to three to x to the fourth, x to the third, x squared, x to the first, where we go downwardly. This is a simple shift operator, okay? If I were to put a few constants of normalization in front of this sequence of polynomials, if I were to take x to the nth divided by the square root of n factorial, we would have a normalized uh, state vector. I'm going to leave off the square root of n factorial in the denominator. I'm going to wipe it away because it, it tends to obfuscate things. It's rather hard to pronounce on the uh, uh, in, in a webcast. It's rather hard to picture in one's mind. It simply obscures things. It can be divided back into the situation if one so chooses. Uh, so nothing is really lost other than the fact that we have to remember that it should be there and we need to put it back in before we're going to get any meaningful results as a unit vector in Hilbert space. Okay? But the point is we have a downward shift operator. The upward shift operator is of course going to be its Hermitian conjugate, its dagger. And a dagger is going to give us the upward shift, where we go not from zero to x to the first, but where we begin at x to the first and go upwardly, x to the uh, zeroth, rather, x to the zeroth. And we begin at x to the zeroth and we go upwardly. Uh, we, we, we start at x to the zeroth, move to x to the first, x to the second, x to the third, x to the fourth, and that is excitation. We absorb, we absorb a photon, and there are two ways to think of it. We include a photon, and in so doing, we take one from the photon C that destroys one there. It's decreased by unity because we're borrowing it. And we're using it to excite the electron, say, in a particular uh, orbital uh, of, of, a, uh, of an atom, okay? This is essentially the basic model for electron excitation in the non-relativistic sense, and it's a perfectly good model. We look at this and we see it shifting upwardly, and we begin to notice that, uh, that, that uh, uh, these guys have an unusual property in that these guys are not inverse to one another, they shift upwardly begins at x to the zero, if not zero. The shift downwardly ends at zero, okay? Mm -hmm. So destruction takes us all the way down to zero. From x to the zero to zero itself, but creation has to begin at unity. It has to begin at plus one, the constant function plus one. And it takes us to the zeroth power, to the first power, to the second power, to the third power, and on up. And we can think of these as uh, simple, discrete, integral jumps. A photon being added each each level, or for that matter, a a very excited photon taking us up five levels by by five steps of excitation. Uh, this is exactly how things happen. When a photon enters a particular system and it's very, very, very energized, very hot, it, 
comes in and it does not knock things up if it if it has the energy of let's say with a fixed frequency omega uh if if it if it has a, a, an energy of let's say five omega clocks constant okay here's here's the deal the the atom doesn't uh, 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 tolerate all this at once. It steps up one one step at a time. It doesn't it doesn't take the energy and just throw it in there and and and, and shoot up infinitely quickly. It uh, it allows the electron to be excited in its orbital by by having this photon sort of. Uh, come in very quickly and run through one step, two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps until it's finished. Now this is this is a, a very important thing because this is uh, this is going to determine the rate of the interaction or the rate of what's going on, uh, the so-called transition amplitude, transition frequency, and uh, the duration of this particular event, uh, such as excitation, absorption. How long does it take? How quickly is it received by the particular electron? How well is it transmitted from the photon? So there are many, many questions that can be answered using creation and annihilation operators. Uh, and it must be remembered that one is a Hermitian conjugate of the other. One of the perfect ways to uh, illustrate what's going on with creation and annihilation operators is the ability to create quanta and ask ourselves, how quickly did that happen? What was the rate of transition? If, for example, I want to create a particle, watch it go from the vacuum state to its maximum attainable state and then back down to the vacuum. <clears throat> what I have done is I have watched a particle come from the vacuum, go to its summit, and then come back to the vacuum, or in other words, cease to exist. This duration is going to be the lifetime, the mean lifetime of the particular particle, uh, and is known as such. Uh, if we look at the term half-life, um, we would look at a we would look at an exponential uh, formulation of this, and of course, splice the time at uh, t over two. Uh, but the mean lifetime is not related to the half-life per se. Uh, in, 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 in an immediate way. We have to cut that time in half. If we want the entire the, the mean or the average lifetime of the particle, we take a look at its wave function, see what happens when it's produced from the vacuum, look at the frequency let it, and the energy, of course, the momentum perhaps, a few other quantum numbers and let it go back down to the vacuum where it ceases to exist. It goes back into that sea of quanta, which is absolutely necessary if we're going to consider positive and negative energy solutions. As we, as we see, we're going from the vacuum up to the vac, uh, back down to the vacuum, and this is known as a vacuum to vacuum or VTV transition. Uh, this is essentially nothing other than saying their their conjugate transposes as matrices, and in a real representation, they are nothing other than transposes. Okay, now this this uh, this pretends the, uh, the, the 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 polynomials of positive power, the positive integral power as a very, very, very good basis for, uh, for uh, creation and annihilation models and, uh, and radiation and, and absorption models. But what else can be done? Uh, is there any, anything else? 
Okay, now, thus far I've used nothing other than positive integral powers and zero. Okay, let me ask you something. What happens that we know there, there's a nice little exercise that can be performed by anyone. If we keep applying to any quantum state that's uh, the state of an oscillator, a bound state necessarily, if we keep applying that oscillator destruction operator, we're going to hit a minimum energy value of plus one half Planck's constant times frequency of oscillation. My question is this, and by frequency of oscillation, I mean angular frequency of oscillation. So my question is this. What happens if instead of looking at this from a destruction creation viewpoint, we look at it from a simple multiplication by x viewpoint, if I take zero and multiply it by x, I don't get anything. If I take one, the vacuum state, and multiply it by x, I get x to the first. If I take x to the first, multiply it by x, I get x squared. x squared multiplied by x, I get x cubed. And I have done the same thing with multiplication by x, so that in this representation, creation can be summed up as multiplication by x, multiplication by the identity operator. That's a very, very, very simple way to, to state it. Okay, there's another way to think of this. Now, if I've got multiplication by x, ought not division by x undo that? And yes, it does. So let's go down to our very basic state, 1. OK. What happens if I begin dividing by x? Uh, can we do that? Because this should be destruction. If I divide away x's, I ought be able to get to these guys very, very quickly. Uh, now, x cubed divided by x, x squared. x squared divided by x, x to the first. x to the first divided by x, 1. 1 divided by x, x to the minus first. x to the minus first divided by x, x to the minus second. x to the minus second divided by x, x to the minus third. Now, what happens? Where did those other guys come from? And how did we jump beyond the minimum value for energy, one half, to get all the way beyond zero down into negative x's? And the answer is we used the mathematical artifice of simple division by x to get us into the Laurent polynomials. Integral, positive integral powers of x and the negative integral powers of x. These integral powers of x allow us to create many, many, many functions, and they're Laurent polynomials around zero. The importance of these guys is we have just created a variety of guys. We have created negative energy states, because if I go beyond every positive energy state from five halves to three halves to one half, which is the minimum possible energy for an oscillator, and keep going, then I must be where in the negative energy states. Now, we're in the negative energy states. Uh, there are several questions. What happened to the minus one? We have plus one is the vacuum for the positive energy states. Uh, ought not minus one be the vacuum being the starting point, the terminus ad quo, for the, uh, for the negative energy states? And the answer is yes. Uh, and so why is it missing? 
Well, we have to put it in, and when we put it in, we end up with an overcomplete basis. In other words, when we throw in minus one, these states are no longer linearly independent. They are linearly, linearly dependent. And this produces a little bit of overlap. To correct for that, we pick the energy as the eigenvalue, and now we go to our artifice, the quantum number, picking the plus one and the minus one. Our first quantum number, our first fermionic number, to pick the eigenvalue plus one or minus one to place in front of the energy value. So, in other words, think of it this way. We have non-negative energy values, and we have a quantum number to throw in front of that guy, uh, E, which is going to be plus or minus. This will allow us now to have plus one and minus one as completely linearly independent states. We'll have cat one, comma, plus one, or and another cat would be one, comma, minus one, indicating that we're at the constant function minus one, okay, with a scalar value minus one. It's going to be a spinner value function. Now, we have to throw in yet another quantum number that we've discussed, but the important thing is we are in the negative energy states. These other quantum numbers can be thrown in in a straightforward fashion, the most important thing to pick up is the topological U1 charge. Uh, now, I want to say something about this U1 charge. Uh, many people are of the opinion that it ought to be integral merely. We know from nature itself that it can be fractional. Uh, we can have fractional charges. This is nothing new to quarks. The quark model really did not bring about a uh, fractional charge. Fractional charge had been envisioned uh, much, 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 much earlier than the quark model. Uh, fractional charge was one of the most canonical things to look for after integral charge. Positive, negative charge led to, is there a fractional charge? So from the times of Gauss, have there been uh, <laughs> fractional charges sought? Uh, recently, we found experimental evidence to show that these are useful. Uh, whether or not they are merely artifices or whether or not they are really manifestations of reality is another question. Uh, we do know that they are useful and that we can add them in and they this will not harm anything. Uh, we know that uh, this will allow us to uh, create a better probability distribution or statistical distribution in our so-called statistical space. We know that this will be able to take us on our track to be able to answer the questions, what are the basic fundamental frequencies that allowed us to look at the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, and on. And these are the guys that we really want to look for. And, of course, this is going to come by way of the field curvature that's to be added in, because it must be remembered this field curvature is a very unusual character. Uh, Many would say, and uh, I was reading a very, very, very well-written book, uh, uh, well, two for that matter, uh, today, uh, just, just for the sake of passing time. And uh, it talks about the problem of these guys being anti-symmetric, meaning they cannot be Hermitian, therefore they cannot be... The, the, field, the field strength cannot be an observable physical quantity. And there is a very easy way to correct for that. And uh, if we look at them in the right way, uh, even though they're anti-symmetric matrices, so let, me, let me explain what we do here. We pick either the negative part or the positive part, and we look at those guys. And those guys will form a linearly independent complete basis for the field strength states. And if we look at that alone, that is the vector space we want to consider for the physical states of the field strength. Now here we're dealing with 
with a simple oscillator. And people might say, I might ask the question, well, what in the heck is the field? Well, the field can be simply the background space itself. And for us, that is where we would like to look. What, what, what spatial manifestations can be measured? And uh, if curvature is one of them, then let us measure it. Uh, another point to be made is that uh, the oscillator model can be generalized uh, so that X in the oscillator equation can be replaced with any generalized position whatsoever, even if that generalized position be some strange anti-symmetric potential operator. In so doing, we create what, uh, what is known as a uh, generalized Heisenberg algebra, or really a function algebra. Of, uh, of, of what some would say is the Heisenberg kind, even though it's, it's a little bit more general than that. And these guys show us that we can treat every covariant derivative as though it were a creation operator or a destruction operator. We can actually switch the roles. And contrary-wise, we can, if we so choose, take the creation and annihilation operators, the creation and destruction operators, and treat those as though they were covariant derivatives. This answers a very, very, very important question. Uh, why is it the case that uh, in free space, if we take a quantum, uh, it ought to travel, if, if, it's, if, it's, if, it, if, it, if it's affected by nothing other than space, it ought to travel a geodesic path. In flat space, that would be a straight line. Uh, on a sphere, that would be uh, a great circle, an arc of a great circle. Why, why, why do we get the quantum wiggle? And that is because we have an inherent oscillator effect that can be explained by looking at the equations of motion with the creation and annihilation operators being seen as covariant derivatives introducing a curvature not necessarily in space always, or time space always, but in the Hilbert space, that infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And for that reason, when we let go a photon, when we let go an electron, when we let go a pion, we are going to see the so-called frequency of oscillation. We're going to see the fact that uh, a free quantum wiggles. But to sum this up, it really what we're saying is that the shortest distance between two points has to be taken by the particle that is going to traverse those, those, the path or the mean paths between those two points. There is an operator of parallel transport, but there are infinitely many curves that connect any two points that are geodetic. Uh, because we have to remember our curvature is taking place in the fiber that is orthogonal to our time space. That is where this curvature is happening. Uh, that is where it is occurring. And so what we are seeing in many cases, is what some would say is an unobservable curvature, and no, it is quite observable. Were it not, <clears throat> uh, Heitler had a very intuitive argument. Uh, Sakurai had yet another intuitive argument. Uh, 
Itzikson and Zuber had their arguments, Bloiler Gupta had their arguments, but there is a very simple proof of the fact that the field strength, the field curvature, or the spatial curvature that occurs in the fiber, the twisting can be observed. It is an observable quantity. It is an intrinsic quantity, and it depends upon the nature of the particle. It depends upon nothing other than that. The, uh, the field curvature can be envisioned as uh, a statistical phenomenon wherein we're looking at an aggregate of particles. And suddenly, these particles develop a particular distribution. Uh, for example, um, water in the shape of a, of a, of a bubble and um, um, oh, a piece of plastic molds it into uh, a particular shape. Uh, these are both examples of field curvature. Uh, a little bit more abstract would be that of uh, aluminum that's been uh, molded into uh, uh, some sort of a capacitor. Uh, and uh, the very geometry of, of what we see around us. And this field strength is anti-symmetric. Because it's anti-symmetric, it can be split into its positive part and its negative part, and the completely positive part can be looked at as, well, it's axial and it's, uh, it's axial vector part or pseudo vector uh, part is, is really a more appropriate way of, of stating it. And we can look at this and we can look at this part alone and remember that there are going to be certain new quantum numbers that are tossed in, those which will preserve this entire vector structure uh, as we transform relative to a, a fixed symmetry group. And there are going to be other quantum numbers such as, uh, uh, well, they're going to be similar to charge parity and, and time reversal. Uh, wherein uh, not everything is conserved with respect to that, uh, as we know from the experiments, the famous experiment of Yang and Lee. And uh, so we can we can see curvature, and we can we can look at this observable as a pseudo vectoral quantity. In general, it is a bona fide vector. Uh, we get we get fortunate. When it is not, we have some nice new quantum numbers to play with. Not necessarily the CPT quantum numbers, uh, not necessarily the interchange quantum numbers, but some some newer guys uh, of a very interesting nature. And we can always expect these little quantum disturbances, these little small fluctuations, to accumulate and some and to some extent if we, if we allow these particles to do so we can find the RMS error the deviation of, of uh, the difference between the L2 norm and the L1 norm we can find that overwhelming us uh, a classical example is uh, the arithmetical average of uh, electricity in the impressed state, the, uh, the ordinary household electricity in the, in the impressed state, where we have a nice uh, sine wave or a cosine wave uh, over a period. And then we look at the, uh, the square of that and compute its average value and take the square root. Uh, we're going to get several different values. and. If we are not, and, and if, if for small values, these are going to be quite close together, and there's there's really really no point in talking about the distinction between the L1 and L2. For tiny guys, for tiny durations, when we allow things to accrue over time, there must be corrections made, and for this one, for this for this for this one reason. Uh, do we see our L2 being broken up into an L1 plus an L infinity 
again, the L1 being the bound state, the L infinity being more or less the finite noise which localizes to the perfect quanta at infinity, provided we're will, willing uh, to compactify the circle. First, I want to say something about uh, the Feynman path interval. A anyone who has dealt with this, uh, this uh, uh, method of so-called functional integration, which in a way it is and, a, and in a way it is not, uh, well, Volterra, is uh, that integration over all paths or various types of fields, we end up uh, double counting points. This creates a very, very important uh, sequence of errors. These errors have to be canceled and they cause divergences of the uh, path interval and this is a problem. We need to steer clear of the path interval until we have we replace it with an appropriate measure that is not going to double count the points. And to see why it does double count the points, think of a point P and just think of all the curves, gamma, that can run through the particular point P. If we begin to look at those, as we sum over all the paths, over all the infinitesimal path elements, we end up counting the position and the momentum infinitely many times. And this is one of the defects of, uh, one of the defective aspects of the uh, path interval.